Okay, so today we're talking about how did World War II come to an end. So we talked in the last video about how World War II progressed. Today we're going to talk about how World War II actually ends. So, we know that originally the war was going really well for the Germans. They pretty much managed to conquer almost all of Europe. So the next question becomes, how was the tide actually turned? Um, so, I left off talking about the attack on Pearl Harbor. So the U.S., we really were not very prepared for war. We had a very small army. We began conscripting troops. Um, and as a result, during that time period, Japan was able to conquer large parts of the Pacific unchecked and was heading towards, um, was starting to head towards Australia. And there was real fear that he was, that the Japanese were going to launch a uh, land invasion of Australia. Now, as far as by 1942, it was pretty much going well for Germany. Um, the Axis pushed very far into Russia, all the way to the Caspian Sea. By the spring of 42, the U.S., we begin to check Japan's expansion. The Battle of the Coral Sea, we sunk a lot of Japanese ships. We were able to help protect Australia. And at the Battle of Midway Island, the victory of the U.S. prevented another attack on Hawaii, because there was going to be a second attack on Hawaii. And the cooperation between the U.S. and the British were very, very strong. Um, but the Soviet Union was kind of suspicious. When, I, I didn't mention this in the last video, but when the Soviets are invaded um, in Operation Barbarossa, that brings the Soviet Union into the war, and the British and the Soviets sign an alliance. When we get pulled into the war, we're part of that alliance as well. Um, so the cooperation was strong, but they were kind of suspicious of Stalin. So this is what we refer to as the big three, Churchill, Franklin, Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. And they met at different events uh, but three major key times they met during the course of the war. The first meeting was called the Tehran Conference. Um, now, the big thing for the Soviets is that they're in kind of the same position that they were in World War I, in that they're fighting the front, the, west, the Eastern Front, excuse me, on their own, and there's really no way to resupply um, the Russians. Um, so in 1942, the conditions were not right for an invasion of Europe, and the Soviets are really pushing for an invasion of Europe because it would take some of the pressure off of them in the Eastern Front. They didn't have the supplies um, that were needed, and the German submarines were able to prevent a large transport of troops. So the question was, how are you going to get all these troops um, into Western Europe to launch this invasion? So November of 1942, uh, the Allied force lands in French North Africa. Um, the U.S. and the British basically caught the German forces between them and were able to crush it. This allowed them to gain control of the Mediterranean, and this gave them a point where they could invade southern Europe. So the Allies planned an, access, an, an assault on the weakest Axis area, which is North Africa. Um, Patton leads the American troops. The Germans were trapped in Tunisia, and they had to surrender over 275,000 troops. In July and August of 1943, the Allies managed to take control of Sicily, um, and Mussolini was driven from power. Um, the Allies then land in Italy, um, and the new leader of Italy actually decides to declare war on Germany. And so the Germans resisted this, and this led to actually a diversion of German energy and resources down to Italy. Um, the Russian campaign was becoming very demanding. By the summer of 42, the Germans resumed fighting, um, but really were not gaining much. Again, the battle at Stalingrad was this very, very, very intense fighting uh, that was going on in Russia. Actually, before I talk about that, I'm going to show you some more pictures from the battle in Italy. So this was the battle for Sicily, June of 1943. This is the battle of Monte Cassino in February of 1944 and the Allies managed to liberate Rome on June 5th, 1944. So, basically, though, going back to Russia just for a second, Stalingrad was, like I said, was a key to a key city because of the oil field. There was extremely in fierce fighting. The Russians lost more men in the Battle of Stalingrad than we did in the whole war. Um, Hitler actually overruled his generals because the generals wanted the troops to retreat, and they lost an entire army. So the Stalingrad battle was a turning point um, in the Russian campaign. After that, the Russians are on the offense, and the Germans are on the defense. And after that battle also, the U.S. was able to at least provide material help and supplies. 
um, the Russian industry was able to continue to grow because remember it was moved further east into Russia and this allowed them to actually keep the offensive. We were sending new tactics, we were sending new technology that could counter the submarines once we actually got into the war officially. Um, American air forces and British air forces began massive bombardments of Germany. Basically, day and night, um, Germany was bombed. So the U.S., we would do precision bombing by day, targeting specific military and industrial targets that were vital to the war effort. And Britain by night would basically do indiscriminate bombing with the desire of hoping to destroy the morale of the people. Um, this had little effect until 1944, but essentially the German, German cities are just being plummeted with bombs and being completely destroyed. Um, which, again, this is type of destruction we don't see that we, we don't see in World War I because World War I, they didn't have this type of technology. They had planes, but you had like, you know, pilots with machine guns mounted onto their planes. They weren't like these massive bombs that were being dropped on cities. By 1945, pretty much the Allies, the British, and the, uh, the U.S., we managed to clear the skies of all German planes and we were able to bomb at will because we could just produce more planes than the Germans could ever think about blowing up. So we attacked industrial targets, communication centers, oil refineries, and all these things helped to shorten the war. And then the terror bombing um, basically just destroyed everything is essentially what you have. So ultimately, how was Nazi Germany defeated? So it was clear always that there was going to have to be some sort of invasion of Europe. Um, so that was planned to be June 6, 1944, which is of course known as D-Day. Um, it was an American, British, and Canadian troops that are going to land on the coast of Normandy. Now, one of the things that was interesting about this invasion, landing on the coast of Normandy, this is a highly fortified area. This required an amphibious attack it required a ton of planning. The Allies had to essentially build floating roadways because it was a beach, so it was shallow water, so they couldn't get their large ships in too close to the water, in too close to the coast. So they had to build floating roadways in which they could drive off their tanks, their jeeps, and everything else that they were going to need to continue the invasion once they established a beachhead. When the Allies were planning this, they tried to, you know, throw the... Germans off the center of where exactly this invasion was going to be. They didn't want uh, the Germans to know where this invasion was going to be coming from, so they actually picked a place that in some ways was kind of, didn't really make much sense to be the, inv the, the invasion point, point because it was actually so well fortified by the Nazis. So in mid-August, um, Allies managed to land in southern France, um, and by September, France was liberated. So June 1940, June 6, 1944, D-Day starts. Um, and then by September, France was um, liberated. But here you could see this the, um, is the landing. And you could see that like the beach then kind of is flat and then kind of takes this dramatic slope upwards, which is where the Germans would have been waiting, which is why this um, invasion had such a, loss, a large loss of life. Because you could see what the American, Canadian, and British troops would have faced because as they're coming and trying to land, the Germans have the high grounds and the Germans are able to shoot down um, and attack them. So, let me just see another one of these landing crafts um, and what they look like. And as the people were getting off, now originally this is obviously after they've gotten the beach because you see actually you know, tanks being driven, but these people in these amphibious things, they would have faced this while the Germans were shooting at them from above. So there were very, very high casualties um, and death rate as a result of this, as you can imagine. Here you can see these are German prisoners being held after the invasion was over. Um, so in December, the Germans launched a counterattack in Belgium, and the Germans were able to push into the Allied line. This is something known as the Battle of the Bulge. Um, the Allies lost heavy losses. Um, in the Battle of the Bulge, and the Bulge is really basically the last grasp for the Germans um, in the West, because the Allies managed to recover, they pushed east, they crossed the Rhine River in March of 1945, and the German resistance essentially crumbled. And in the east, the Russians were able to sweep forward, and by March of 1945, 
troops were near Berlin. Now, when the British, the, the Americans, and the um, I think this is the British in Paris, August 25th, 1944. But when the British, the Americans, and the Soviets were discussing how this war was going to end, they did not want this war to end like World War I in a way in which the way that the war ended was a armistice and could be ambiguous to the German people. So it was decided that this was going to be an unconditional surrender, that the Germans were going to be very clear and very obvious to know that they had lost the war. So the Germans are going to fight on until May, and the Hitler, the Hitler, I mean, well, the Hitler's Hitler and his wife, who he married in the bomb shelter, commit suicide in his bunker in Berlin on May 1st, 1945. And here you see these are the U.S. troops in Paris. U.S. troops in Paris. This is the Battle of the Bulge, um, where the Germans were able to, you know, kind of create this bulge and kind of push through the line, but the Allied line managed to never break. Um, here is Hitler and his mistress being hung in Milan in 1944, 1945, and here are U.S. and Russian soldiers meeting at the Elf River, April 25th, 1945. And then Hitler commits suicide, sorry, May 1st, April 30th, whichever day, um, 1945. So Hitler basically married his longtime girlfriend, Ava Braun, and then they celebrated their marriage by shooting each other, shooting, by committing suicide and shooting themselves. Stalin actually insisted that what they, because Hitler's final wishes was that he gets shot. After him and his wife commit suicide, their final wishes was to have their bodies burned, which they were. Um, Stalin insisted on getting Hitler's skull, so Stalin, one of his prized possessions was a burnt out skull with a hole in it, with a hole in it. He insisted it was Hitler's skull. We are not 100% sure if it actually was, but that was Stalin's prized possession. So what's known as VE Day is May 8, 1945, Victory in Europe Day. So you can see some of what the newspapers look like. Um, this is a monument in Berlin to Soviet occupation. Um, and then that is called the, oh, I forget the name of the church, darn it. But it's a church in Berlin that's purposely left in its bombed out condition as it was after World War II to kind of be as a monument to the devastation of war. So the last head of the Japanese Empire fall. So the war in Europe ends May 8, 1945. Um, and so at this point, Japan's defeat is pretty much inevitable. Um, by 1943, the U.S. were doing something that was referred to as island hopping, which was basically moving their bases and strategic sites closer and closer and closer to Japan. By June of 1944, they've reached the Mariana Islands, and from there, attacks could be launched on China, Japan, and the Philippines. The U.S. recaptured the Philippines, because at one point, the U.S. lost the Philippines. This is this account known as island hopping. So they recaptured the Philippines and drove the Japanese fleet back to Japan. And then, um, in 1945, they captured the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, which are right here, which were very close to the mainland of Japan, which allowed them to begin launching air attacks on Japan. Uh, so they destroyed Japanese industry, disabled the Navy, but the Japanese government was still re refusing to surrender. So here we can see this is um, the U.S. surrendering um, in the Philippines in 1942. And here is General MacArthur returning to the Philippines in 1944. So you can see the U.S. Marines raising the flag over Iwo Jima. Um, and then also what was known as the Bataan Death March just happened in 1942. There were 76,000 prisoners, 12,000 of them were Americans, other than them were British, and they were marked 60 miles in the blazing heat of POW camps in the Philippines. If you stopped for anything, you were shot, um, and many soldiers were killed while this was happening. So we get to as close to Japan as, like I said, as Iwo Jima. Um, sorry. To Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Um, and it was decided to plan an attack on Japan. The fear was that it would cost Ameri about a million American lives and many, many more Japanese. So the decision was, instead, was to use the new weapons, um, 
that the U.S. developed, which was the atomic bomb. So the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. 70,000 were killed immediately. 40,000 buildings were destroyed. And then hundreds of thousands died later of radiation and cancer. They still didn't surrender. So then August 9, 1945, the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Um, at that point, the on August 14, 1945, the Japanese finally did surrender. Um, so it becomes VJ Day. September 2nd, 1945 is when the peace was signed on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The one condition that was made was that um, the emperor would get to stay, and President Truman decided to accept that condition. And you can see this is the famous picture of the sailor kissing the woman in Times Square. Everyone was excited. The war was over. So, what was the human toll of all of this? Military deaths, um, it was about 15 million with at least as many civilians. Include death indirectly connected to the war, you're talking about 40 million. Most of Europe and large parts of Asia were devastated, and we see this brings on the coming of the atomic age. So here you can see casualties in Europe, casualties in Asia, just in general, casualties, um, massive dislocation of people, the refugee crisis in essence. So. Why was World War II able to be brought to an end? I want to think about that, and I'll see you in class.